My name is Steve, and I am a recovered alcoholic and addict. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. And tonight, we're going to talk about my very best and current understanding of the problem of addiction, the solution of recovery, and the program of action that brings about that solution. And we'll touch on the continued program of action that grows and sustains that solution. We're also going to talk a little bit about intervention and how the judicial plays a part in the role of treatment for people that suffer from the illness of addiction. We're also going to talk about the differences between someone who, in fact, is a real addict or alcoholic and not just a substance abuser, because there is a difference between a substance abuser and someone who has the illness of addiction. And we're going to talk about the differences in the two. So we're going to get right started with the simple truth about the illness of addiction. The illness of addiction affects all three of the basic areas of human existence. For example, each person has a physical body, and each person has a mental consciousness or a mind, and each person has something deeper. Some people call it soul, some people call it spirit, some people refer to it as universal mind, Whatever you want to refer to it as, it's that place where we feel love for our children and for our families. The illness of addiction affects all three areas. When a person has cancer, all feel sorry for that person. But not so with the alcoholic and addict illness. For with it goes an annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. Now... The alcoholic is certainly physically ill. And we're going to talk just for a few minutes about the physical characteristics of the disease of addiction. The physical allergic reaction that alcoholics and addicts experience to the use of chemicals is a manifestation of an allergy. Dr. William D. Silkworth who was a physician at Towns Hospital in Central Park West in New York City. He was a prominent physician doing a fabulous and humane work in the field of treatment for addiction. He had lost his family practice during the Depression. And after treating over 2,500 alcoholics and addicts, a very clear reality of what addiction was came to him. He had an unpopular theory that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics that he treated was the manifestation of an allergy. That it was limited to this class, and it never occurred in the average temperate drinker. And what is the physical allergy? The action of alcohol on these allergic types. The physical allergy, or the illness of the body... It takes place when the alcoholic or an addict puts the substance in their body. It's very important to understand that when the alcoholic or an addict puts the substance in their body, it triggers a cycle of craving. It happens every time the alcoholic or an addict puts the substance in their body. Now, when my mother drinks a beer, she simply gets full. However, when I drink a beer, something happens, which makes it impossible for me to determine when I'm going to stop. Now, it's not unlike any allergic reaction. There are some people that are allergic to shellfish. For example, if we're in a restaurant on Tuesday night and we're eating shrimp and all of a sudden my throat swells up and we turn, I turn blue, I fall, I keel over. A physician at a nearby table runs over with a steak knife, opens up an emergency airway and saves me. I just had a near-death allergic reaction to shellfish. Now, I'd like to ask all of you, what conclusion can I draw from my future relationship with shellfish? I can't, I can't use it. I can't use... Shellfish. How about if you come and visit me on the hospital that night because they kept me overnight because they had to do an emergency tracheotomy 
And you walk up and you say, man, Steve, your allergic reaction scared me. It was a near-death allergic reaction. And I respond by saying, I know, I'll never eat shrimp again. Except on Friday, I call you on the phone and I say, how you doing? I got some shrimp, come on over. What would you think of me? Would you say I had an illness of the mind? How about if you cared about me, you would probably say, well, Steve, you, you had an allergic reaction. It almost killed you. And how about if I responded by saying, I know, I know, eating shrimp on Tuesdays is tearing me up. I'm only going to eat it on the weekends from here on out. But that's what an alcoholic or an addict will say about his using. And that brings us to the more insidious part of the disease. And that's the illness of the mind. Pay close attention. Every human being is at risk for addiction because of how our minds are set up to learn. How our minds are set up to learn. Our lizard brains, our God-created brains are programmed to remember pleasure and forget pain. This is why women have more than one child. Because what they remember is the euphoria and the relief of giving birth and how wonderful that is. Their brains don't lock on to the nine months of gaining weight and indigestion and the terrible hours of painful labor. Because if their brains could lock onto that, they probably wouldn't ever have children again. Now, what did the alcoholic and addict brain learn the very first time we ever got good and high on something? Each person learns that alcohol and drugs is wonderful. It is a euphoric experience. I mean, second to none. The very first time I can remember it like it was yesterday. The stars were out. I remember what the atmosphere was like. And woo, it was great. So, you know, we talk a lot about the allergic reaction that alcoholics experience to alcohol. But we don't talk about the hopeless obsession of the mind. Each person needs to pay close attention to what I'm about to say. The illness of the mind, once your brain learns that... There's no unlearning it. You can have 37,000 negative experiences with that chemical. But at a certain point, every time we say, I'm never going to do that again, there is the reality of the inability to keep away from the next one, no matter how great the necessity or wish. There is a simple diagnostic question for the illness of the body. How many of y'all have drank or drugged more than you intended to? Here's the diagnostic question for the illness of the mind. How many of you have drank or drugged despite saying you would never do that again? Boom. All the hands. Now, it brings us to this conclusion. We can't not use. Can't use based on the illness of the body. Can't not use based on the obsession of the mind. Is the verdict of inevitable annihilation for the alcoholic or an addict is the truth about addiction. I'm damned if I do use and I'm damned if I don't. It is a hopeless condition. You can't think it away. You can't learn your lesson it away. You can't go to treatment it away. You can't make up your mind it away. It cannot be reasoned with or bargained with. It ain't going away. Ever. If you got it. This is the difference between a substance abuser and the real addict. A person that uses drugs and gets in trouble and is faced with the commitment of incarceration, that person can stop or moderate. The real alcoholic can't. You can threaten him with being thrown in prison and throw away the key, and he'll be drunk that afternoon. However, society looks at that person and says, well, you'd think he'd quit for her. Or certainly, he should quit for those children. This is a person who's beyond quitting for those children. This is a person who is so sick that his condition is hopeless. Science has not created a pill to fix this one yet. You know, from a scientific perspective, there was a female pathologist doing cancer brain chemical analysis research in Dallas, Texas. And in the 20s, it was politically correct to live a clean life and then donate your body to science. However, she ran short of bodies to test. 
So she struck a deal to drive around with the Dallas coroner and to pick up unclaimed bodies. And she stumbled across a brain that had a chemical called tetrahydroxyquinlin or THIQ. It's a sister chemical to formaldehyde. It's also one of the most powerful opiate drugs. If you could take it and bottle it and sell it, it'd be the most powerfully addicting substance on the face of the planet. Not supposed to be in the human brain. So she checked more bodies and didn't find THIQ. And then she checked more bodies and found more bodies with THIQ. So then she began to trace the histories of the bodies. The people that lived clean lives and donated their bodies to science did not have THIQ. But the unclaimed heroin addicts and alcoholic bums that died in the streets of Dallas had THIQ in their brain. She was later able to determine through further research that they had an addiction gene, a genetic predisposition to a metabolism breakdown during the metabolism process. When a normal person metabolizes alcohol, they take a drink, it enters into the stomach where it is turned into acetaldehyde. And then it is further broke down to acetone. And then it is filtered through the liver and the kidneys and it's gone at the rate of about one ounce of alcohol per hour. That is the normal metabolic rate for the normal consumption of alcohol. But this person with the addiction gene when they take a drink of alcohol, in between the acetaldehyde and acetone breakdown, a stalling takes place in the metabolism process. The metabolism slows way down, and then the brain secretes the chemical, tetrahydroxyquinlin, and it deposits itself on the pleasure center of the brain, where endorphins create chemicals such as dopamine and serotonin, these chemicals that give us a natural sense of well-being. The THIQ depletes our supply of dopamine and serotonin. Our brain screams for these needed chemicals, dopamine and serotonin. And the body interprets that as a craving for another drink or another hit or another smoke or another pill. The phenomenon of craving is very real and it is progressive. Gets worse over time, never better. When an addict first starts out, the phenomenon of craving, they might not even be able to detect it. But as they get into their 20s and as they get into their 30s especially, the phenomenon of craving becomes much worse. You talk to any cocaine addict and they'll tell you, when I was a teenager, I could use cocaine until midnight and stop and go to bed. But by the time he was 25, he was up for three days until his money was gone, till his resources were gone, till he begged, borrowed, stolen, everything he'd get his hands on to the fat lady sings, and then he still laid there and wanted more. What is that but a phenomenon of craving? Now, we talked a little earlier about this spiritual malady. The alcoholic and addict, I don't think, has a monopoly on the spiritual malady. I'm not here to talk about all human beings. I'm here to talk about alcoholics and addicts. Alcoholics and addicts have the symptoms of an unfit soul condition, an unfit spirit condition. I had it long before I ever picked up a drink or a drug. For example, when I was 11 years old, my parents put me in pri private school where I wore Wrangler jeans and everyone else had polo shirts and Levi pants. I also had the worst case of acne. I had a deep sense of not belonging. I was skinny and I felt like I desperately needed and wanted to fit in, only I could not. I walked around with a hole in me the size of God. Children can be cruel at that age and I was picked on. I don't think any worse than any other child could be picked on, but the picking affected me much worse than other kids being picked on. In fact, I was so hyper and super sensitive that every little pick that came towards me, it bowled me over emotionally, which further deepened and widened the hole in me the size of God. My deep sense of not fitting in and not belonging. And along came a young boy in a very similar situation to me, invited me to his father's place in Raleigh, where he introduced me to a drink of alcohol and a marijuana cigarette 
for the very first time. And when I took a drink of that Jack Daniels, the hole closed. I suddenly felt whole and complete. My entire life has been a search for wholeness or completeness. It is in this realm of the spirit condition that recovery can take place. Because every time I would have a bad experience with these chemicals, and I would come with a firm resolution that I was never going to do that again, I was sincere and I meant it. But when you take alcohol and drugs away from me, I'm right back to age 11 with the hole in me the size of God again. And I am restless, irritable, discontented, uncomfortable in my own skin, sober. And as each day goes by, I become a little more uncomfortable and a little more unsettled and a little more angry and a little more bitter. And as time goes on, my emotional barometer begins to rise. And I get downright, they people, people call it a dry drunk, stark, raving, sober. Where my fists are clenched and I'm just miserable and, and I don't have the Midas touch, I have the poop touch. Everything I touch turns to poop. <laughs> and when the emotional barometer gets high enough, without any help from me, I have a brain that's programmed to go on an automatic search for what's going to comfort me. And guess what memory it finds? The memory of the first time I drank that Jack Daniels. I become obsessed with that idea that this time when I drink Jack Daniels, it's going to be wonderful like it was when I was 11. The illness of the mind is also progressive because the illness of the mind has been to every AA meeting I've been to. It's been to every treatment center I've been to. It's done every four step I've ever done. It's called my sponsor every time I've ever called my sponsor. It knows what I knows and it will use that information to delude me. Because after I'd been in treatment 30 times, I could no longer justify and say, hey, this time when I do crack, it's going to be wonderful. I knew when I smoked crack, it would be terrible. So here I was trying to stay straight without a proper program of treatment. And the emotional barometer started to rise. And pretty soon my mind went on the automatic search and it found it. And I had that initial thought that this time when I smoke crack, it's going to be wonderful. My intellect would say, wait a minute, I smoke and crack, it going to be wonderful, it's going to be terrible. And I'd get this terrible feeling in the pit of my stomach, and I'd start to pace, and I'd go, oh my God, I'm, I'm thinking about smoking crack, oh, I'm not going to do it though. Now, wait a minute, am I going to do it? Oh, no, I, in fact, if I smoke crack, it's going to be bad. Nothing good's going to happen. I'm probably going to end up in jail. I know I'm going to end up in big trouble, but screw it. What is that but the illness of the mind? That is a delusion. Because... It's not the truth, because the next day, I care. When I try to convince myself that I don't care about the consequences, the truth is, the next day, I care. How many of y'all have done the screw it only to wake up the next morning going, Oh, why did I do that? Why did I do that? The reason why you did it is because you can't not do it. Until this thing is properly treated. The only time-tested, proven method of recovery from addiction in the history of written language. Since man crushed grapes, there's been addiction. There's been groups throughout history that have tried to treat addiction. In the 1700s, it was the Washingtonians. In the 1800s, it was the Oxford group. Men practicing first century Christianity. And in 1939, a miracle took place the publication of a written down, planned, precise sequence of events that bring about the conclusion of freedom from the disease of addiction. And it was from this publication that a worldwide fellowship grew. People often say, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I've sat in AA meetings where people said, well, the fellowship was around long before the book. Wrong. The fellowship was unnamed when the book was published. The fellowship took its name from the book. Back in the old days, after the Saturday Evening Post published an article, Alcoholics and God, people wrote frantically to the small New York AA office and said, I know someone that's a hopeless alcoholic, will you help us? 
they would send him a copy of the textbook Alcoholics Anonymous. And people that are non-alcoholics, when they read it, they know it's a textbook. But when alcoholics read it, we don't, we don't we think it's gobbledygook. <laughs> but it is truly a set of directions on how to correctly apply the program. And they would apply it. They would have spiritual awakenings as the result of the work. And then they would have motivations to want to help other alcoholics. And AA groups popped up all over the country. By far the fastest growing organization in the history. The textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous is the number two selling book in the history of the written language. It contains the only time-tested, proven method of recovery from addiction. Now, there are people in the recovery community that think that well-meaning professionals in this field have a difficult time reaching an addict because they themselves have not been in their shoes. Just out of curiosity, how many people in this audience have felt like there was well-meaning therapists, counselors, and psychiatrists, but they just couldn't reach you because you knew they hadn't been where you are? Has everyone had that feeling? I know that I have. For the therapeutic value of one addict or alcoholic who has recovered as a result of doing this work, properly armed with the facts about himself and how to recover, can unquestionably gain the confidence of another alcoholic very quickly and guide that person onto the solution. So in trying to intervene in a practicing alcoholic or an addict, the first thing people want to do is they want to take them and throw them into a psychiatrist or throw them into a therapist. And therapy is great and it's well needed for a lot of alcoholics and addicts. But it is not the solution for the disease of addiction. A spiritual transformation must take place in order to recover from this disease. People will say, well, you need to go to meetings. Well, meetings are fine. But if a person had cancer, would meetings cure him? You've got terminal cancer? Well, just don't have cancer and go to meetings. That's what they tell the alcoholic. Oh, you've got addiction? Well, just don't use and go to meetings. To tell a real addict to just don't use is exactly like telling someone suffering from clinical depression to just don't be sad. Or telling a homeless guy to just buy a house. Just buy a house is not representative of the truth about addiction any more than just don't drink is any representative truth about the illness of addiction. So, the 12 steps done correctly Listen carefully to this statement. Somewhere, somebody hung the 12 steps up on the wall. But they didn't hang the directions for them up there with them. The 12 steps are like a list of ingredients to a recipe. And what's critical beyond the list of ingredients? The precise sequence and amount and measure of when and where and how they go so that you end up with the desired goal. You see, I read an archive where Bill Wilson had written a man named Pat Butler, the founder of AA in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he said, Pat, people are hanging the 12 steps up on the wall. The newcomer's going to get the wrong idea. Because the 12 steps found on pages 58 and 59, or I should say 59 and 60 of the textbook of AA, are not the program. They are but a summary of the program. A shortened, condensed, incomplete version of. They are simply statements of principles that summarize what we do in the action of the 12 steps. The program is found in the first 103 pages of the big book. It is a precise, specific, and explicit, clear-cut set of directions on how to properly apply these principles in your life. And none of them will do you any good until you understand the hopelessness of step one. Until a person understands the hopelessness of their condition, that they are suffering a can't-use, can't-not-use, no-win, lose-lose, hopeless scenario. That there's absolutely no human power that can solve it. Until a person first admits that complete hopelessness, step two will have no meaning. You can do all the four steps in the world, all the amends in the world, all the meetings in the world, all the apologies in the world, and you're going to drink. The power of the 12 steps is in the sequence. You take them out of sequence and they are ineffective. Each step properly taken delivers you to the next one. Once you sense the sense of dread of, oh my God, I'm suffering from a disease of the body and the mind? You mean I've got a body that can't drink and a mind that'll never leave it alone? 
I'm doomed. The word hopeless or hopelessness is used 29 times in the first 103 pages of the big book. The word doomed is used three times. To hammer home the truth about the problem. That's how serious it is. Ain't going away. You'll either treat it, you'll die from it. Either quickly or slowly. But either way. So, the correct way to treat the illness of addiction is for the alcoholic or an addict to get introduced to a treatment program that utilizes the 12 steps. It's okay to go to a treatment program that utilizes psychiatrists, doctors, and therapists. Those are very good, well-meaning people that help a lot of people, and a lot of addicts need that kind of care. But without the spiritual transformation, all the religion and all the psychiatry in the world is not going to help you. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of you for your patience and listening, and uh, have a good night.